Welcome everyone to this presentation of our upcoming members report on pandemics as existential risks and enablers of change. My name is Casper. I am head of publications here at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, and I will be the host and moderator for today. A few short instructions before we get started. Please write any questions you might have in the Q&A window in Zoom. Following the presentation, we will do, do a Q&A session where all your questions will be answered by the presenters, but we will also be going through questions live and answering them in real time as well. So please do write your questions in the Q&A window as they arise. Uh, the presentation will be approximately one hour and 15 minutes followed by our live Q&A. So we do hope you will stick around till the end. Before we begin, a short introduction to who we are. The Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies is an independent nonprofit futures think tank founded in 1969. The Institute was established as a collaboration between Danish public and private organizations in order to use future studies to help qualify decision making in the present. Um, as part of this ongoing work, we publish four major uh, annual research reports that engage with uh, global themes viewed through a futurist lens. These reports are written and researched in-house by our resident futurists and supported by contributions from qualified academics and industry experts. Uh, we are currently in a redesign process. We are redesigning all our publications portfolio as well as our entire visual identity at the Institute. So this presentation is also a sneak peek into that. Uh, you can see our new logo appearing in the top corner of your screen. Um, as part of this process, we are also launching all new subscription packages for all our publications within the next few weeks. So do stay tuned to that and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter for updates and announcement concerning this. So your presenters for the day are Emilie Balk Müller, Søren Jensen, Patrick Henry Gallen, Aaron Spishak, Niklas Larsen, and myself. We have been working from home over these past few months, as I'm sure many of you have as well. But today we're coming to you live from the Institute. Uh, of course, keeping with social distancing, we are coming to you from our separate PCs. Um, so in this presentation, we will take you through pandemics in past, present, and future perspectives in that order, while also highlighting how future studies can be used to think about pandemics as both existential risks to people and societies, and on a more positive note, as enablers of long-term change. So to start off, in order to make decisions about the future, we need to draw on our knowledge of the past. So now in a few seconds, my colleague Emilia will take you through a journey, uh, through history, talking about the many different ways in which uh, outbreaks of disease have shaped society, going all the way back to antiquity and up to our present day. She will also be providing you with an overview of how something as tiny as a disease pathogen can cause a global pandemic. And with that, I give the word to you, Emilia. Hi, thank you, Casper. And hi, and welcome to First Pandemics One-on-One. -on -one. So as our understanding of the course and spread of disease has improved, so have our responses to them. And fighting contagious disease is a race against time when we have megatrends like globalism, population growth, and urbanization, accelerating the speed of infection and decreasing the time available for us uh, to prepare for them. In the Middle Ages, it took the bubonic place years to spread from China to Europe. In 1918, the Spanish flu spread well while in a matter of just months. But in 2020, it only took COVID-19 weeks to cover the entire globe. Looking towards the future, the disease spread will only accelerate um, and therefore highlighting the importance of global preparedness. In this timeline, we'll see major historical pandemics as well as the evolution in public health. 
if you look into the pandemics of the past, they were brutal and they were devastating. And I will just walk you through four of them and the changes they made to the society. We will start with the largest pandemic ever, the Black Death. It was the bubonic plague, which took the life of between 75 and, uh, 75 and 200 million people in just 20 years in the Middle Ages. It originated in Central or East Asia, and then it traveled through the merchants route throughout Eurasia and North Africa. And when it hit Europe, 30% of the population died, which led to large changes in the entire social and economic system. Because with a smaller population, the value of the peasant labor increased, which, which contributed to the demise of the feudal system. So therefore, the Black Death enabled societal change. On the health initiative side, the bubonic plate laid ground for the first quarantine, uh, quarantine laws ever recorded. In, 19, or in 1492, the Europeans arrived in the Americans, and with them, they were bringing diseases to the native populations. Diseases such as smallpox, measles, and the bubonic plague. The natives uh, had no immunity towards these new diseases, and therefore they devastated the population and paved the way for the European conquest. 90% 90, 90 of the population died uh, under the new world epidemics. And the following European colonization led to the discovery of gold and silver, which led to an increase in wealth in the world, old world economy, and in the end, led to the formation of the modern capitalism. capitalism. So thereby, the new world pandemic enabled economic change. The Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919 was one of the deadliest pandemics of our time. It hit during World War I, which is a really, really poor timing because the resources were spent on military, there was a lack of materials, and the population was undernourished and brought to the knees. And this led to the loss of 50 million lives. It also led to changes in our approach to healthcare and the government's role in preventing the spread of disease. It led to the establishment or strengthening of health ministries worldwide and to the creation of an international bureau for fighting disease, a forerunner to the WHO. So upon the Spanish flu, new approaches to healthcare arose. The HIV and the AIDS pandemic uh, taught us about the lethal danger of social stigmas. It was first observed in the American LGBTQ plus communities in the early 18, uh, 1980s. But all the way back, uh, it was found to be jumped from chimpanzees to humans in West Africa all the way back in the 1920s. The early association between homosexuality, HIV, added to the marginalization of victims and neglect of research and treatment. Even when testing, treatment, and prevention measures eventually became available, many did not access these services out of fear of further stigmatization, violence, or arrest. The virus killed more than 1 million people in 1996 alone, uh, and the joint UN program on HIV and AIDS uh, was formed to coordinate a global action against the virus. Although the HIV and AIDS pandemic led to critical advances in medicine and public health, like the development of antiretroviral drugs, the needle exchange programs, and the widespread use of condoms, the disease had exposed how social stigma can be a persistent barrier to achieving progress in public health. The pandemic we find ourselves dealing with today may turn out to be as impactful in shaping our futures as depending of the past were. While it's way too early to draw any conclusions, we've already seen how the need for social distancing over a prolonged period has forced us to be a part of the greatest experiment ever conducted in remote work and education. It accelerates innovation in digital health and exposes the need for robust national healthcare systems and international preparedness in times of crisis. It is clear that, in, that the negative economic fallout will be severe and our responses will affect how deep and long the income recession will be. But finally, COVID-19 will teach us about how our current climate trajectory can be altered. With everything on hold, we see massive reduction in greenhouse emissions worldwide. So we see that change is possible, and my colleagues will be exploring these perspectives and more shortly. But before they do, I will just walk you through the biology of the pandemics and how they actually arise. Because in order to understand what causes these epidemics and pandemics and how they can prevent them, we must understand some of the biology behind and how COVID-19 plays into this. So first, disease outbreaks are caused by microorganisms. And when they cause disease, we call them pathogens. There are four different groups consisting of virus, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Most pandemics throughout history, though, have been caused by either viruses or bacteria. And they are tiny little things invincible to the human eye, which is also why they're often referred to as the invincible enemy. 
But while bacteria are small living organisms that can replicate on their own, viruses are not. They are a collection of organic matter unable to replicate on their own and therefore they're dependent upon a host. Their only goal in life is to infect, replicate and survive. When novel viruses occur in a population, it very often, it very often occurs through something called a zoonotic transmission. Most novel viruses that cause infectious diseases comes from animals like pigs, bats, uh, like birds, <laughs> pigs or bats. They are called zoonotic diseases. They arise when humans come in clo close contact with an infected animal, often through extensive farming or wildlife hunting. And actually, three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases in people comes from these animals. Um, that is also what happened with the virus causing co the COVID-19 because the virus is a family member of a well-known well -known family of coronaviruses. The virus natural reservoir is a bat, and there are currently now seven members of the corona family who has made the jumps from bats to humans. Four out of these just cause mild flu-like disease, and then we got the other two, the SARS and the MERS, which are far more deadly. The novel virus causing the COVID-19 has gotten the name SARS-CoV-2. It's believed to have made the jump uh, to species uh, they made the species jump to humans in a wet market in Wuhan. And these wet markets, animals of different species are placed in close proximity in cages and they're in close contact with people. But zoonotic transmission doesn't just happen when a human gets in contact with an animal carrying the virus. Animal viruses cannot simply jump between species. In order for this to happen, some genetic alteration must take place. These alterations are known as mutations. And when one virus gets the right mutation to affect a human, the virus will not be able to transmit from human to human without additional mutations. So for an animal virus to infect a human who can infect another human and thereby start a disease outbreak, a perfect combination of different mutations must take place. And therefore, these events are rare, but not impossible. But once they do, and then transmit between humans, uh, that can happen through several mechanisms. Um, it can either be direct or indirect. And I'll just go through the direct here, which is what we see with the COVID-19. So direct transmission is happening directly from an infected host to a susceptible host. And most often, like with the COVID-19, it's through droplets when people sneeze or cough and talks, and then it enters through our eyes or nose or mouth. Also, the virus can survive in droplets for several hours on surfaces so that people can get it on their hands and thereby infect themselves when they touch their face and people touch their face around 2,000 times a day. So one of the challenges with COVID-19 and transmissions is that a disease has a relatively long incubation time, meaning that a person can be infected not knowing and don't show any symptoms and thereby move about uh, and affect other people. And even worse, many people, especially young people, are asymptomatic throughout the entire infection period, posing a threat to spread unless they're under lockdown. But one thing is transmission between people, another is transmission across borders. Because once a disease outbreak has an affected an an unusual large number of people in a short time frame, it's considered to be an epidemic. If this epidemic goes global and disease outbreaks happens in other countries at large scale, it's considered to be a pandemic. And lastly, the world has never been more global than today, with extensive traveling all over the globe making it possible for a virus to jump on a plane with a host and cross borders like never before. Thank you, Emilia, for taking us through the history and the biology of pandemics. From the past, we move into the present. Although we are currently navigating uncharted waters with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are already seeing some major global shakeups as a result of this disease. So, what are some of the biggest short-term changes we have seen so far? With that question, I want to give the word to Søren for an overview of the global impacts of the coronavirus as of today. Thank you very much for that, Casper, and thank you, Emilia, and hi, everyone out there. So, let's start with a helicopter tour of the immediate global impacts uh, from the coronavirus. Because now, in the middle of this crisis, we really see how globalized the world has become. The free flow of goods, services and ideas have moved the global economies into unprecedented times of wealth and technological progress. However, this virus has also highlighted some of the weaknesses of this highly connected and interdependent world. 
what you see here is how the virus has impacted the global economy. Hmm? Economic shocks, of course, is nothing new, but they've historically been triggered by wars, overheated economies and acid bubbles, or oil price shocks or political crises. An economic crisis uh, triggered by a virus in the modern world is something new. And the speed at which this virus has hit the economy has been shocking. The double uh, supply and demand shock has rattled our global supply chain with the World Trade Organization estimating a collapse in trade of between 13 and 32% in 2020. The world's largest economy, the United States, they've so far seen around 30 million filings for unemployment in just six weeks where the total job losses from the last recession, the financial crisis, amounted to 8 million people, but that was over the span of two years. Globally, GDP is projected to contract by 3% in 2020, surpassing that of the financial crisis. The IMF does, however, expect a swift recovery back to growth in 2021, so far, yeah. Another sign, of the economic slowdown has been evident in travel, especially international air travel, as most planes uh, remain parked on the ground. Prominent voices in the airline industry is not expecting things to return back to normal, as in 2019 traffic before 2023. And in part as a result of the slowdown, the oil price has also been very volatile during this crisis. Low demand and overproduction as a result of a trade war between the OPEC countries and Russia has led to historically low oil prices. Even seeing a day where trading dipped into the below zero. Prices does, not seem, does now seem to have somewhat stabilized around $25 a barrel, but that is still far too low to balance the state finances of the nations relying heavily on oil profits. Lastly, in terms of a gear to handle this pandemic, the WHO estimates the global monthly need for 89 million masks, 76 million gloves, and 3 million liters of hand sanitizer. The global shortage of personal protection equipment has unfortunately pitted some countries in bidding wars against one another, and we've even seen this within certain countries. On the positive side, even perhaps for the wrong reasons, we're also seeing the smog lifts from cities around the world, for example, in New Delhi, air pollution has fallen to 10% of their usual levels as a result of this lockdown. So to sum up, much of this disruption, uh, disruption may be temporary, but the crisis is likely to have a lasting global impact, especially as it reinforces existing trends that are already undermining globalization. It may deal a blow to fragmented international supply chains and also and reduce traveling patterns and provide political cannon fodder for our nationalists who favor greater protectionism. But the economic fallout might also refocus and rebuild supply chains with more resiliency. It might reorient society towards less resource intensive consumption, and it might elevate global cooperation to new levels. Thank you, Sean, for that. Now, the impacts of the current pandemic have been global in scope, but the responses to the pandemic have varied greatly from country to country. And the fallout of COVID-19 does not hit us all equally hard. So in the following section, Patrick will take you through how nation states have responded differently to the crisis, how the pandemic exposes inequality, as well as how, as how it affects our social behavior. For example, when it comes to dating, learning and working. Yes, uh, thank you, Kaspar. Uh, <clears throat> so to start off, yes, uh, to be sure, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the various national responses to it have, in a really unprecedented way, uh, laid bare some of the ideological differences, economic inequalities, and great disparities in societal and technological readiness uh, between countries and their healthcare systems. Uh, in this way, the pandemic is really reminding us that the capacity and priorities of the international community are different, and that these differences, for better or worse, matter, especially in crises. Uh, so what we've done here is, is has chosen four countries that represent uh, vastly different responses to the pandemic, and we'd like to walk you through them. <clears throat> Beginning with uh, Denmark, where we are headquartered, uh, it's important to note that Denmark has taken many of the similar uh, lockdown measures as our European neighbors, uh, but with one interesting uh, difference in terms of the economic response, which has been particularly uh, robust. Um, 
shortly following the, the implementation of lockdown measures, Denmark uh, rolled out a number of, of very comprehensive economic uh, relief packages, including uh, most notably, I think, the, pay the payment of the entirety of uh, public sector wages, as well as up to 90% of monthly wages for private sector uh, workers. Uh, and how is this made possible? Well, it might be in part explained by the Danish social model, which is uh, often employed for collective bargaining. And it's a kind of negotiation framework between the government, industry associations, and workers unions. Uh, a similar framework was employed to negotiate these relief packages with, uh, with relative speed. Uh, the country has also had uh, pretty healthy finances prior to the crisis, uh, with public debt making up uh, a relatively small portion of the national GDP uh, compared to, to the rest of, of Europe. Um, it's important to also note that as of today, uh, Denmark is in the process of reopening parts of the economy uh, as the disease is considered to be adequately managed. Uh, it will, of course, be fascinating to see how uh, this relatively aggressive strategy that has been taken by Denmark will fare compared to one of our close neighbors, Sweden, uh, which has taken much softer measures and received a lot of press coverage for, for doing so. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out over the long term. Um, and it's also interesting to note that the, the discourse among leaders in both of these countries has focused very much on, on welfare of, of the state and welfare of society. Uh, but it's clear that this focus has played out very differently in practical terms uh, in both of these countries. Uh, moving on to a very technologically uh, focused approach that we've seen in countries such as Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, these countries uh, have been heralded as examples of how thorough planning and effective use of technology uh, can mitigate and potentially prevent public health crises. Um, and perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of this is Singapore's uh, use of contact tracing, which is essentially a form of uh, detective work on a population-wide scale, uh, where public health workers uh, have been tasked with contacting and isolating people with whom infected individuals are believed to have been in contact. Um, this has been further bolstered by a number of technological applications, uh, among them a smartphone app that was released by Singapore's uh, government technology agency. Uh, this app is actually, the code for this app has actually been released in an open source format uh, for other countries to develop into their own uh, national uh, uh, response systems. And the government has also been engaged in a pretty comprehensive fight against the spread of misinformation, which has been rampant, uh, along with the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, it has been contacting citizens on social media and messaging platforms with daily updates on official responses. Uh, so what are some explanations for this response? Uh, part of it might be uh, the high rates of technological adoption and willingness to employ technological solutions in government in these jurisdictions, uh, but also, of course, past experience with outbreaks such as SARS and H1N1 in the 2000s. Uh, there is also a relatively open acknowledgement that uh, supply chains, uh, supply shortages, and infrastructural breakdowns of these countries could quip, quickly cripple them. Uh, for countries like these, uh, ensuring that crisis preparedness is an element of all policies is not only a result of past experience, but also a matter of survival in the future. <clears throat> Uh, we move on to the United States, uh, which has, uh, in its response to COVID-19, been plagued very much by political deadlock, miscommunication, and even antagonism between federal, state, and local authorities. Uh, although the federal government has published containment guidelines for uh, COVID-19, these guidelines are largely unenforceable. This is left up to the states. Um, this has uh, resulted in uh, 50 different solutions running at the same time and an uneven patchwork of lockdown measures and closures, et cetera. Um, while there is a great deal to unpack in terms of the United States response from an inadequate testing to lack of health insurance coverage and problems with rolling out economic relief packages as millions of Americans have applied for unemployment, uh, one of the most striking aspects of the response has been uh, attempts among the federal leadership to place blame on other members of the international community for mismanaging the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is perhaps most starkly marked by the Trump administration's decision in mid-April to cut off funding for the World Health Organization. Um, these outcomes can in part be accounted for uh, by unstable and unprepared leadership uh, that has refused to take responsibility, uh, but also illustrate the drawbacks of a complex federal system in which the division of authority between state, local, and federal government uh, is unclear or contested. <clears throat> And of course, despite the uh, uncertain conditions in the United States to date, uh, the federal administration, as well as a number of state governors, have expressed an eagerness to reopen the economy as soon as possible, prioritizing economic recovery, perhaps beyond uh, uh, stability in the health system and health of the population. Uh, we move finally to Ecuador, which represents uh, an example of an underfunded and unequipped health system. Uh, and in 
coupled with an incapacitated state apparatus, a kind of perfect storm of, of bad conditions. Um, as some of you might have read in some uh, media reports that were circulated quite uh, quite actively a couple of weeks ago, uh, as the outbreak of COVID-19 hit the largest city in Ecuador, uh, Guayaquil, the end of March, uh, the local health system became very quickly overwhelmed. Uh, and within a very short period of time, the health system was even unable to perform basic uh, tasks such as disposing of corpses uh, that uh, have been piling up essentially as a result of the spread of the virus. Um, the outbreak has highlighted the role of social and economic inequality in managing public health crises, as well as the country's uh, many, uh, the fact that many of the country's poor citizens have neither the financial means nor the public safety net to self isolate and refrain from working long enough in order to slow the spread of the virus. Um, while the government has issued a cash stipend to informal workers to encourage them to comply with stay at home orders, many of these workers in the informal sector are actually non citizens, uh, mostly Venezuelans who are fleeing from. Uh, political, pre existing political and economic turmoil that has existed for a number of years uh, and who have therefore been able to, uh, unable to uh, claim this support. <clears throat> The situation in Ecuador makes an important point about inequality in public health crises, uh, namely that weak states and fragile economies are in the most precarious position overall. Uh, for example, half a billion people are poised to be cast into poverty as a result of COVID-19, uh, of course, mostly in emerging and already fragile markets. Uh, in these areas, we may also see the resurgence in diseases like measles and polio in the wake of the pandemic, as the focus has shifted almost singularly to combating COVID-19 and in the process has sup suspended things like vaccination campaigns. Uh, but of course, the, the pandemic has also made bare very stark inequalities in wealthier countries as well, uh, where it is clear that socioeconomic factors like race, ethnicity, income and sex have significant impacts on mortality and access to care. African Americans and other minority groups in the US, for example, have had uh, significantly higher mortality rates than whites. Um, while many workers have also had the luxury of and luck of maintaining their jobs by being able to work from home, these workers overwhelmingly represent uh, highly skilled and highly educated parts of the workforce and generally have higher incomes. In this case, it is again becoming clear that those who are most vulnerable uh, are perhaps the worst off. The COVID pandemic uh, <clears throat> Uh, has in many ways also created a natural experiment of sorts that uh, has been of uh, global proportion. So we'd like to examine a couple ways in which uh, the spread of the pandemic and resulting lockdown measures have changed the way we uh, relate to each other and the world around us. Uh, looking at family relationships, uh, we've seen that long periods of uh, home confinement have proven to put an unbearable strain on some relationships. Uh, in China, for example, where lockdown restrictions are in the process of being lifted, uh, some lawyers have reported a, a spike in the case, uh, in their caseloads in terms of divorce cases of around 25%. Uh, the reports of domestic violence in certain countries have also gone up significantly. Uh, France's Ministry of uh, the Interior, for example, uh, reporting within the first two weeks of strict lockdown measures being put in place, a 30% spike in domestic violence cases being reported uh, throughout March. Uh, we can also look to changes in substance abuse, particularly alcohol. Uh, in mid-March, in-store uh, sales of spirits in the United States were up nearly 30% as people were spending more time at home uh, compared to the same period last year, uh, whereas online sales peaked uh, or, or went up to around 40% more than the same period last year. <clears throat> in contrast, Greenland uh, announced a ban on the sale of alcohol at its capital city, Nuuk, in March uh, to prevent a surge in domestic violence and child abuse in a country where uh, alcohol has a longstanding association with harmful behavior. Uh, we've also unfortunately seen a spike in xenophobic incidents related to COVID-19, uh, as some commentators and even world leaders have promoted the narrative that certain ethnic groups are responsible for spreading the virus. Uh, <clears throat> we can also look to changes in dating. Uh, of course, which, uh, dating has undergone a transition to, to more digital interactions over the last couple of years, uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic and its fallout has pushed us even further into the online realm. A Spanish online social media analytics company reported uh, within just a couple hours of the Spanish government announcing strict lockdown measures, uh, the use of Tinder uh, went up by almost 100% among people uh, under the age of 35. Uh, some of these users, it's been seen, uh, have decided to weather their quarantine periods together, hunkering down for undetermined but uh, definitely lengthy periods of time uh, after only having just met. Uh, well, this and other factors related to, to dating uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, have unclear implications for things such as birth rates. Uh, some have speculated that the quarantine conditions will result in a generation of so-called corona babies who may one day bear a common designation uh, as quarantines. Uh, we've seen a big shift uh, to online learning as well, as education has made a headfirst leap into the digital world. Um, 
We have, of course, seen that some students have been able to make this transition relatively smoothly, uh, having access to the digital tools and services needed to, to make this transition possible. Uh, but we've also seen that this shift has exposed uh, deep disparities, not only between poorer countries and richer countries, where uh, access to such things uh, can generally be a challenge, uh, but also between families in wealthier countries where there can be significant resource gaps based on a number of socioeconomic factors. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, schools are an important source of, of food and other services uh, for poorer students uh, that are currently unable to, to get these things. <clears throat> Lockdown measures aimed at stopping the spread of COVID-19 have also, of course, as many of us have experienced uh, a shift uh, to uh, working in digital spaces, working from home. Uh, and this has raised a number of questions about the boundaries between home and work life uh, and the rights and privacies uh, of workers. Uh, this might be very well exemplified by Sneak, a video conferencing app, uh, which has benefited from a tenfold increase in business in the early weeks of lockdown measures in the US. Uh, Sneak is like any other video conferencing service, uh, but sets itself apart in one way in that it is always on. The program requires that users' webcams are always activated and takes a picture of whatever is in the webcam's field of view every one to five minutes throughout the workday. Uh, Sneak's creators claim that this is not meant to be a surveillance tool, but many commentators have uh, raised concerns about the implications of such technologies for employers' privacy, and again, how this may blur the distinction between uh, work and private life. Thank you, Patrick, for taking us through the different uh, responses we have seen from um, different nation, nation states uh, to this pandemic, as well as highlighting the impact of this disease, both in terms of inequality and how our social lives are altered, in some ways, perhaps permanently. Moving from the social to the technological, the, the short-term responses to the COVID-19 pandemic have been supported by innovations in technology, as well as new ways of using existing technologies to combat the spread of disease. In the following section, Aaron will talk to you about the role technologies like AI and telemedicine play in fighting disease today and in the future. Thank you, Casper, and thank you, Patrick. Um, so as Casper mentioned, I'll be speaking shortly about the technological proliferation we've been experiencing in the past couple of weeks and months as a result of this global pandemic. And more precisely, I'll be speaking about cases where we have finally Im implemented already existing technologies into our everyday lives, and cases when innovative technologies and ways of collaborating help us in fighting off COVID-19. For the implementation, we were looking for technologies and tools that, that have long existed, but were not being used to their full potential. For example, this includes AI. As I'm sure many of you know by now, an AI company called Blue Dot from Canada identified the outbreak in Wuhan way before the World Health Organization was even notified. Their methodology includes the official sources such as the CDC and the WHO, but their strength is that they combine these official sources with scans from commercial flight data, population data, climate data, and local news articles in 65 languages. This is significant because what if the WHO had this kind of technology already implemented? Could they rely less on governments for their information and act quicker in the future? We'll see. Uh, a second example we've seen is uh, using social media data to forecast diseases. So this tool was originally intended to forecast when, where, and how hard uh, an influenza will hit a specific population influenza being a disease that also spreads from person to person. And this forecasting method consists of analyzing vast amounts of Twitter data to see the spread of disease. Essentially, what they were looking at is tweets where people mentioned the flu and used text analysis to differentiate whether the person was showing symptoms or they were discussing a person showing symptoms or just talking about the flu in general, for example, as the news reports do. This data is then combined with the official sources again to provide a better picture of disease spread, just like in the case of Blue Dot. A third example is implementation of telemedicine or telehealth. The concept of telehealth is not new, uh, as it was first mentioned in an 1879 article in The Lancet that discussed using the telephone to reduce unnecessary doctor's visits. Since then, we've made huge technological progress, and some countries have even implemented aspects of telemedicine. Today, we think of telehealth as wearables, devices to monitor patients at home, video conferencing, and in the case of COVID-19, at home, it could soon be at-home testing kits. 
As an anecdote, I've been living in Denmark for eight years and have not had any video consultations with my doctor. And a week after the lockdown came into effect, I've had my very first video consultation. And of course, it didn't go without any hiccups. While the video was working, there was no sound. But the important thing is that it is being implemented and used. In terms of the future of telehealth, COVID-19 might be the push decision makers needed to fully embrace it and implement it more broadly. Now that we've looked at technology being implemented, let's see some examples of how innovation was sparked by COVID-19. AI makes it top of our list again, with a company launching a tool that helps their customers monitor their workers' adherence to social distancing measures through security cameras. This technology analyzes real-time video streams from cameras and identifies the movements of people and highlights if they came close, too close to each other. Of course, this technology is not new, but the way it is used is. Secondly, we cannot discuss technology and COVID-19 without mentioning contact tracing. Contact tracing as a tactic to identify spreading of a disease is once again not new. Traditionally, it was done through interviews and in-depth in detective work, as Patrick mentioned before. Uh, but the advent of modern technologies, such as the smartphone, allow for a much faster and more accurate form of contact tracing these days. There's, of course, plenty of heated debate of, about whether contact tracing should be done through GPS phone location data, surveillance videos, and credit card records like in South Korea, or through short-range Bluetooth communications used by Singapore and others. But again, the point is that it is being done. The last example is not necessarily concerning technology itself. Rather, we looked at new forms of collaboration that arose because of COVID-19. A good example of this is Apple and Google's contact tracing initiative, where they are working together to develop a shared API so that competing phones can communicate with each other over Bluetooth and notify if, if it, they came into contact with an infected person. Another example is IBM, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft partnering with the White House to lend their massive computing power to help solve the crisis. In fact, we had a discussion with Clayton Hamilton, coordinator for digital health at the World Health Organization's regional office for Europe. And the main takeaway from our discussion is that the entire tech community rallied around the WHO to support their activities for the global good. And that it is ironic that it takes such a tragedy to align the big tech, big tech companies, which had only been a dream prior to the pandemic. Thank you, Patrick. Oh, sorry, Aaron, for taking us through the role of technologies, new and old, in fighting disease today and in the future. I will briefly step out of my role as host and join as a presenter to talk to you about how language has also become a very powerful tool that shapes how we approach and understand this disease. More specifically, I want to talk about um, what kind of metaphors we use to give shape and understand this pandemic, and also how the way we use these metaphors impact how we approach the disease. Uh, more specifically, I want to zoom in on the role uh, war metaphors play in all this and their potential implications uh, for the future um, post-COVID-19. So as our current pandemic engulfed the globe, our political leaders uh, worldwide were quick to frame the efforts to stop the spread of disease in a sort of a warlike metaphors, very warlike language. In China, we saw that Xi Jinping vowed to wage a so-called people's war against Corona. In France, Macron declared the country at war with an invisible enemy. And in the US, Donald Trump declared himself a wartime president. Here at home in Denmark, uh, the national media broadcast interviews with elderly citizens who had lived through the Nazi occupation of the country in World War II. Um, comparing the lockdown of today with the curfew of the 1940s and sort of hammering home the, the similarities between the COVID-19 virus and, and invading and occupying enemy force. So, the, this, this kind of use of warlike terminology um, in times of crises has some very obvious uh, advantages. It draws on universally understood images and concepts. It divides the world into allies and enemies. And it asks of you, the receiver, to enter into sort of a psychological state of emergency and to abide with the directions of the sender. For these reasons, wars are one of the most um, 
readily used metaphors in politics and in public discourse, often applied to encourage compliance with measures that might otherwise seem very, very drastic to us. Um, most notably, these kind of metaphors can be used to push public opinion, uh, push politics in a certain direction. Uh, we saw this, for example, during the UK referendum uh, for Brexit, where, um, um, where these kind of uh, uh, Brexit, Brexit as battle metaphors were very frequently used by the conservative politicians and commentators, often comparing the referendum and the following negotiations to exis Britain's existential crises and wars of the past. Uh, going even further, a war metaphors uh, can also be used to legitimize expansions of governmental powers that would be unthinkable in times of peace. In the US, we had a so-called war on terror declared following the September 11 attacks to justify widespread measures to contain the threat of terrorism. And these measures included indefinite detentions of individuals, um, searches of homes and businesses without consent, and monitoring of telephone calls, emails, financial records, etc., without a court order. Um, so going back 15 years, many of these provisions were, were to sunset in 2005, uh, four years after passing, but most of them uh, actually linger on to this day. Um, these kind of measures also made their way outside the US. In, in Denmark, we had the so-called uh, terror of 2002 and 2006, which mandated that telephone and internet providers uh, store information on all Danish citizens for a year, and which also loosened the restrictions on Danish intelligence for obtaining information and gathering uh, data on um, individuals from public authorities. So what these examples show is the power of language to frame politics and to push the goalposts in a direction further down the line, which would perhaps not have been considered acceptable um, during normal times. Um, so few, few people question the need for these kinds of invasive measures during a legitimate crisis, but the long-term risks lie in the potential misuse of these kinds of measures when the immediate threat has passed. Um, as for our current war with COVID-19, one area in particular will be very crucial to monitor in the years to come, given how relevant it has already become, uh, namely uh, digital surveillance. So fast forward to today, and as Aaron has just explained, uh, contact tracing and data collection in the name of public health has become an effective and vital part of the global short-term COVID-19 response. Uh, it has allowed us to track the spread of disease and to take action in order to break the infection curve. In the medium and to long-term, however, it becomes more uncertain what these new and very liberal uh, data collection and storage measures will mean and to what end uh, they will be used other than fighting COVID-19. For example, in the, in the EU, the European Commission has already sought to centralize all European telecom data in one large data bank in the name of um, monitoring the spread of disease and to speed up prevention. Um, in China and South Korea, um, infected citizens are now required to uh, engage in uh, digital contact tracing um, by downloading an app to their phones so the authorities can, can track them and warn them uh, if they have been in contact with someone thought to be infected with uh, COVID-19. So the, the issue with measures such as these is not that they're ineffective, they most often are very effective, but uh, the challenge lies in the fact that they rarely come with a guarantee that they will not be used for other purposes past their expiration date uh, once the current crisis has passed. Uh, in fact, history tells us uh, the opposite is most often the case. Luckily, we know that data surveillance in the name of public health does not need to be an all or nothing question. Uh, Aaron also touched on it before. Uh, we have seen, uh, for example, Apple and Google 
propose uh, plans to build a new opt-in that is a voluntary system uh, which is decentralized and which allows individuals to know if they have been in contact with someone infected with COVID-19. Uh, and this sort of approach constitutes uh, an alternative to the very centralized and uh, uh, vulnerable model proposed by the European Commission, among others. The de decentralized approach also um, guarantees a much greater degree of uh, accountability and transparency. Um, so in keeping with the war metaphors of our leaders, now is really the time we need to decide that if we make data collection a permanent weapon in the fight against disease, do we make it a precision missile or do we make it an atomic bomb? And with that, um, we move from the present and into the future. I will give the word to Søren and Niklas for a closer look at the scenarios for COVID-19 going forward, as well as um, some of the short to medium term, more concrete uh, changes uh, on the horizon. Thank you very much for, for that, Casper. Yeah, now let's take a step closer to the question on everyone's lips. How is this pandemic going to unfold and how is it all going to end? Let's just make it clear. These questions are impossible to answer with a high degree of certainty. We can, however, make plausible scenarios based on scientific research and disease modeling. The hammer on the dance is a useful analogy to talk about how societies are handling the current situation. What you're seeing on the graph is time on the x-axis and the number of new cases on the y-axis. The hammer symbolizes the broad societal lockdowns that we're witnessing around the world in order to curb the spread of infections. Many nations, including us here in Denmark, are now entering the dance. This is a dance between lives and economics where parts of societies are gradually reopened, usually decided by a calculation around where can we capture the most societal value per human interaction. Nations are facing tough decisions during this phase, open too fast and risk triggering a new wave of infections, or open too slow and risk agitating the population and depressing the economy more than necessary. So fundamentally speaking, when can we return to normal? Well, the answer is not exactly satisfying. One way could be when the virus has been eradicated, which seems unlikely at the moment, or it has mutated to a weaker strain, but that could take years. So a more realistically uh, would be when enough uh, for the population has developed immunity against the virus, either naturally or through vaccination. So let's have a look at the current development, vaccine development landscape. There are currently over 100 vaccines being developed globally with at least five of them already being tested in humans. It's worth, worth to note though that 93% of vaccines fail somewhere during development and testing. And they have an, an average development time of 10 plus years. So to make it quicker than that, we have to cut a lot of corners. So this is what a typical vaccination development program looks like. And this is what an accelerated timeline looks like if we're going to reach the much talked about 12 to 18 month time frame that you've heard so much about in the media. A lot of stuff has to happen simultaneously during this uh, period. Overlapping phases of clinical trials, large scale pre-built production facilities and accelerated approval and distribution processes. The arrival of an early vaccine is definitely possible but it is a nowhere near certainty and hiccups and delays could happen during any and all of these steps. An important point about vaccines in the context of Corona is that we are potentially uh, injecting this into billions of perfectly healthy individuals. So we have to be absolutely sure that the side effects are benign, especially considering that the mortality rate of COVID-19 is at worst in the single digit percentages. So to sum up, there's a great deal of uncertainty in this space and the timing of when a mass-produced efficient vaccine arrives could lead us into vastly different futures. So Nick, could you tell us a bit about the framework we've used to build these corona scenarios? Thank you. Absolutely, Saren, and thank you for, for that. Lead into the scenarios that we have been building here um, for the corona going forward. Um, first of all, 
we at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, and we do a lot of scenario planning. And we do that by using a classical, uh, classical two by two scenario model, built on critical uncertainties and their equal polarities forming the backbone of such scenarios. So coming from CERN's point of view, um, around the high levels of uncertainty regarding how long this crisis will take and when we will see an efficient uh, widespread vaccine. We have to ask ourselves whether our social mitigation strategies will be effective or ineffective in the long run. On the other dimension, we will have to ask ourselves if the, if the vaccine will be available before or after two years. These two uncertainties are forming the backbone of the four scenarios that we have been developing. Um, and taken from the top, uh, we have the furious effort and a fast recovery, where the first global wave of COVID-19 was, uh, was also the last, and the efficient handling of the pandemic was brought under control uh, by the end of 2020. If we go forward, um, there's also a scenario where we, we, which we have called to lose, you lose. Here, vaccines developments run into more complicated situations, um, than the most optimistic expectations. Uh, their prolonged social distancing measures are making people more agitated. Um, and if we go towards the third scenario, we see a long and painful stride in a protracted downturn where we have more sufficient mitigation strategies, but we simply cannot develop a vaccine timely. Um, this means that re-emerging outbreaks has to be handled on a continuous basis uh, with strict immig immigration controls and forced quarantines upon international travels. The very gloomy scenario, um, or the gloomiest one, so to say, is where uh, nothing really works, where there is the likelihood that the vaccines are inefficient uh, and we have to live with this invisible uh, enemy for a very, very long time. Also, uh, there's a possibility that it will develop uh, with several forms of viral strains that we cannot um, curb with these current vaccine developments. So these, pa these four worlds paints uh, plausible pictures of how this crisis might unfold. We have also tied them to potential economic development where we in the first one, due to the fur furious effort, will see a fast recovery. In the two lose, you lose, we will see the double dip in the economy. We will see the protracted downturn in the long and painful stride. And in the worst of the four scenarios, we will see an economic disintegration. These scenarios will be unfolded in the report to a larger extent, very much concerning the economics, the sustainability, the political landscape, also the social landscape. Um, yeah, so look forward to receive the report where you can dive into that. We will move on to our pandemic repercussions that we all have right now. Now what, we ask ourselves. Um, in a state of crisis, it's completely normal and natural that we feel bubble mentality. We focus on ourselves, our immediate family, our, our closest ones. Uh, we have tendency to practice short-termism. We do not have the long lens on or the long light on to say. Uh, and we lack direction and we're anxious about what the future might hold for us. Um, to see the long-term picture through the fog of uncertainty and rapid change, we can see it through the lens of megatrends. Megatrends is something we work a lot with here at the Institute, and we now ask what kind of changes these might entail, um, as they might pave the way for opportunities, innovation, new business, and new structural change. Will fertility rates increase or be suppressed after such crisis? And how will Africa weather the storm with a younger generation? Will we regionalize our supply chains or will we strengthen collaboration across the globe? Will shift from sick care to healthcare accelerate along with self-monitoring healthcare? Will collection and sharing of applic and application of health data enhance pattern recognition of disease? Will we allow substantial surveillance if it can co curb our pandemics going forward or disease outbreaks in general? Is a democratic process too cumbersome for effective crisis management? Will time spent in quarantine cause people to realize the value of human interaction? Will it impact physical consumption? 
Will we grow more ecocentric or increase our sense of community? Could this, from an evolutionary point of view, cause a boost in agility and digitization? Will we see the end of cash and move one step closer to cashless societies as viruses could spread? Will we see tests of blockchain solutions for elections to avoid uh, public gatherings? One more round. Is it time for beyond GDP to capture broader well being measures? Will we see a period of redistribution of wealth and tax reforms? Will we appreciate the unintended environmental benefits uh, of the COVID 19 shutdown? Or will the climate and sustainability agenda drown in the coming recession? To what degree will the combination of health data and smart city sensory infrastructure be commoditized? Being more digital has proved to be a blessing, but also stressed our vulnerabilities and dependencies. How will this affect how we consume in the future? An economic downturn may worsen inequality and regionalization. What would this mean for political stability, trust and global collaboration? And finally, Will universities be replaced by on-demand education and who would, play, who would such players be to offer that? Um, and will our ability to work remotely reshape the future need for office spaces? While we cannot answer all these questions yet, we have activated our global scanning network that sits around the globe to help us understand and observe trends and developments. And we have divided three sets of horizon scans into governments, behavior and urbanism. Very briefly, I'm going to take you through them, and they are concerning uh, limits for cars after lockdowns in both uh, Italy and in Belgium. We see the rise of digital bureaucracies. As governments learn from the COVID-19 experience, they will shift investments in favor for more smart structures uh, that enable them to curb uh, next, uh, the next event better. We also see the green, uh, green governments if, uh, initiatives in both Amsterdam and in South Korea. Amsterdam will be the first city uh, in the world to adopt what is called the donut model that take into account planetary considerations. And we have in South Korea seen a 2050 carbon neutrality goal. New behavior. Um, cities that are hit hard, hardest might face a future where we will see segregation patterns once the difficult situation has, uh, has been controlled. These segregation patterns might even be uh, emphasized around the world with the emergence of immunity passports. And um, I think it's Chile and the UK that recently published plans for, to roll this out. However, the World Economic Forum is very much arguing against this at the current moment because uh, immunity is uncertain. We will see the uh, emergence of work from everywhere. We are very focused on working from home at the moment. However, um, people with kids, people faced with loneliness uh, or other types of things that make working from home inefficient will soon be met by several types of companies like hotels and there's even a ride share company that are now offer, offering various types of workstations. A very interesting one is the last handshake. Will the more dominant form of greeting and accepting uh, and making um, arrangements be lost in the COVID-19 pandemic? There are several other uh, greetings from, from other cultures around the world where we do not necessarily have physical contact that could be potential solutions for the universal greeting going forward. Finally, we have new urbanism where sensors and sewers are uh, detecting germs and, and dangerous bacteria. We will essentially see the next generation of smart cities because of this. On a more low-tech side of things, we will see uh, tape and paint help us navigate the, uh, the public space when, 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 when lockdown is, uh, is ending, um, just to make sure that we are far enough away from each other and that there is um, um, the right amount of people at the right amount of square meters, basically. And then we have the idea of walkable cities. The pandemic suggested we should distribute smaller units, such as of hospitals or schools uh, across the more 
uh, across more of the urban tissue to strengthen local centers. To sum up these horizon scans, it is clear that if COVID-19 is a rehearsal for shocks to come in the future, it is clear that people and organizations that are agile enough to respond quickly to the needs that emerge in the short time horizon is the one that will be more resilient in the future and consist of a specific fabric that we will need more of. Thank you, Nick, for raising some of the many important questions in the years to come and for sharing some concrete examples of some of the changes we see on the horizon already today. We promised you in the beginning that we would um, talk about how future studies can help us think about violent events like pandemics and also provide at least some of the answers to some of the questions that arise while helping us see the light at the end of this very gloomy tunnel. Uh, Nick, uh, you have just told us about how megatrends can help us frame our questions. So what are some of the other thinking tools and methods we can use from future studies to make sense of this very uncertain time we are living in? Thank you. Um, we ask, we need to ask how to prepare for the unthinkable and how to discover opportunity in crisis. Uh, as one thing is certain, the future won't be shock-free. Pandemics, global climate collapse, or a unrestrained AI that make humanity redundant, all of these are more or less likely disaster scenarios that pose significant risk for the well-being of us all in the long run. And pandemics belong to this particular group of risk called catastrophic and existential risk that, that threaten us, uh, that everybody. Um, however, these are poorly understood, and we have very few historical references to draw upon in order to assess their probability or take into uh, account or take adequate measures into account, sorry. Um, going forward, we have learned with Corona that we need to start paying attention to low probability, high impact events. We need to embrace our ignorance and be humble around our existing knowledge and we need to start exploring. In terms of risk and resilience, there's a particular animal that has gained quite some attention these days, namely the black swan. Um, the black swan theory argues that the frequency and impact of totally unexpected events are generally underestimated. Why, uh, with hindsight, they can be explained, um, but there are almost no prospects of predicting them. Much of the media has called the current pandemic a black swan event. That is something totally unpredictable which we don't agree, agree with. Uh, however, the idea is that there's very few models that help us think the unthinkable. So we will present such uh, a few of those. One of these things that can help us think in these terms are called, uh, is a theory called post-normal times. It describes an in-between period where old orthodoxies are dying and new ones have yet to be born. And very few things seem to make sense, very much like the one we find ourselves in right now. Here, the black swan have gotten two other friends, namely the black ele elephant and the black jellyfish, that can help us discover different types of blind spots, study change, and explore possibilities. The black elephant is an extremely likely and widely predicted event. However, it's usually uh, ignored widely by society as a whole, like the pandemic, which we had been warned about for many years by expert that has anticipated this event and warned us how, uh, about how grossly unprepared we would be if such thing would happen. Black swans, events totally outside uh, and way beyond our observation. Uh, a classic example of such is the 9-11 event. And a black jellyfish is a little bit more difficult and complicated to get your head around. However, uh, they are portraying things that we think we know and think we understand, but it turns out to be more complex and more uncertain than we actually expect. Um, and we have underestimated, or we cannot estimate, the size of effect and the, after risk after, and the risk after we hit a certain uh, tipping point, very much like both with uh, Donald Trump and with climate change. Another tool in the uh, post-normal times theory are called the Three to uh, the three tomorrows of post normal times, as you can see here. Um, it is designed and developed to help us explore complexity, chaos, and contradictions. Um, 
it goes across several time horizons that also help us think about these three animals that I just introduced. If we look at the extended present, that is to say that the present is more than the right now that we're in, uh, because many of the observations and trends uh, that we see are profoundly rooted in the now. However, they will manifest themselves because we have more data, more evidence, more certainty that they will, will actually happen. Uh, further down, we have the familiar futures that are our images of the future that we find familiar from strategies, from visions, from sci-fi. And the last horizon is the unthought futures. Um, it's not the, necessarily the unthinkable only, it's just to say that it is, there is a horizon out there that we can help uh, in our mental, that can help us in our mental toolbox uh, as it's populated with seemingly infinite alternative futures. So why is it that we need several time horizons? When we are focused on one trajectory too much or a specific outcome, it often make us, makes us forget why we uh, focus on studying the future in the first place. If we're trying to predict something to get somewhere, we tend to focus too much on a desired path. And as a result, we are less open to things that are contributing to the larger picture. We have a tendency to extrapolate our knowledge from the past into the future as it will look like the past. And we have built our lives, organizations and societies to, in such a way where deviations from the norm can have critical consequences. In the wake of phenomena like pandemics uh, or war or economic crisis, where new demands, mindsets and behaviors are emerging, we need to ask ourselves um, what our imagination can do in harnessing these opportunities, not just to bounce back to normality, what we have before, but to bounce forward and thrive in new ways that are consistently resilient and sustainable. In order to give you an idea of how we can see uncertainty as a resource rather than an enemy, we have built this framework in, uh, that, that relies on the high levels of uncertainty in post-normal times. The goal here is to understand how to look for things that we may not have seen before, things that are new to us, things that are emerging in complex, in, in complex times. It's a framework that gives us opportun uh, opportunity to identify uh, solutions and opportunity, as well as gives us under an understanding of potential several futures that we can prepare for, which would give us the idea of more resilience. On the bottom side of this framework and on the right side of the framework, you will see that there is, uh, uh, it's targeted uh, or made in terms of organizations and individuals. Common for those um, is that the future just not, does not exist. It is something that um, exists in our imagination and hence we need to use our imagination to anticipate the future, to make sense of complexity. Um, more known, uh, a more known toolbox for doing so has been future studies that has been around for 70 years. It has been, the systematic study of possible futures, and there are all these different tools for doing so. Uh, Mega trends, the futures cone, we have horizon scanning, we have scenario planning, we have wildcards. There are many other than these. It's uh, not 100% uh, exhaustive. Common to these is that they have uh, a purpose of risk mitigation and ideation and innovation. On the other side of the spectrum, focusing on individual capability, we have futures literacy, which is a framework, an open source framework developed by UNESCO. It describes the capability to use and imagine dif uh, different and multiple futures for various purposes in different contexts. Um, what the theory tells us here is that we need to be aware of our anticipatory assumptions which is how we anticipate and how we perceive the future. And once we become aware of these, we will very much um, realize that they are tied to hopes and fears. When we realize this, it allows us to use the future in different ways, which are described as anticipatory systems. It's planning for optimization, it's preparation for contingency, or it's looking for novelty and emergence in times of complexity. We need three building blocks for doing so. We need the ability to, uh, to, to convey narratives and we need to be able to reframe scenarios uh, with which we see the future. And we need the uh, collective intelligence to build on each other's creativity and knowledge.
a futures literate person essentially is uh, a person that knows that there exist multiple futures and use them to innovate the present, takes informed decisions based on this and are open to novelty. Thank you, Nick, for this overview of some of the methods and tools we can use to think about pandemics and other threats on the horizon. Speaking of other threats, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic was not a historically unique event. So looking ahead, what else can we expect waiting for us lurking out there in the future? Saran, can you take us through some of the uh, take us through the risk landscape and how to um, to think about risks? I certainly can. Thank you very much for that, Caswell. Yes, let's try to look at the risk landscape of uh, future pandemics and existential risk. Some of the world's brightest minds have written extensively on the subject of risk. The German sociologist Ulrich Beck introduced the concept of risk society back in 1986, right after the Chernobyl disaster, which was probably not a coincidence. In his book, he discusses the reasoning for why the global existential risk landscape is increasingly posed by human-made threats. Essentially, he emphasizes that we've evolved from a first modernity where the classical industrial society was able to calculate and predict risks in a linear manner to a second modernity, where the increasingly higher levels of uncertainty makes it much harder to calculate and predict risks. So paradoxically, the same technologies that are raising living standards globally are at the same time the main source of structural existential risk. With this theory in mind, let's have a look at the existential risk landscape. Let's get some definitions in place first. Existential risk is defined as an event with an outcome that would annihilate Earth original and uh, intelligent life. A catastrophic risk, on the other hand, are also pretty bad, but they are not quite extinction level events. There's also a distinction to be made between the risks that we have faced for millennia and the risks that we as a species have introduced ourselves. The natural occurring risks are also risks mostly out of our control. These could be cosmic threats like asteroid impacts or natural slow climate change. It could be unavoidable, unavoidable pandemics or super volcanoes like the one lurking below Yellowstone. On the other hand, we have risks that we've introduced ourselves and that we, uh, as a consequence, have larger degree of agency over. These risks include nuclear war and experimental technological accidents. It could be the development of artificial intelligence, which carries significant risk and has been jointly warned against uh, in the recent years from prominent people in the field. Global warming also carries catastrophic risk, which is probably the one that we are most aware, aware of right now. The biological risks are also pretty self-evident right now. Uh, the catastrophic risks include environmental risks, biological warfare, and engineered pandemics. Many of these risks may seem unlikely, and sure, in any one year they are improbable. But over time, small probabilities accumulate. The Oxford uh, Future of Humanity Institute, headed by philosopher Nick Bostrom, estimate that we face a 19% chance of extinction before 2100 with the majority of this risk coming from technological risk. And because existential risk reduction is a global public good, much like global warming mitigation is, individual nations will tend to underinvest in it. Now let's uh, dive into uh, the biological drivers that could enable the next pandemic. Well, there are quite a few sources accelerating pandemic risk. For example, enlarged animal interfaces, global warming, and continued uh, rapid urbanization. Close contact with, animal, with animals, as we've recently been reprimanded, carries the risk of zoonotic diseases making the jump from animal to human. The main drivers for this to happen are simply increased human and animal contact, especially with wildlife, enabled by deforestation, bushmeat hunting, and human habitation encroaching on wild ecosystems. Global warming is exposing new threats as well. The warming planet is a melting permafrost that's been frozen for millennia, releasing ancient virus and bacteria. Also, rising global temperatures are expanding the reach of mosquitoes and associated diseases like Zika, dengue fever, and malaria, 
which thrive better in warmer and more humid climates. Thirdly, global warming is also changing the water cycle, leading to heavier rainfalls and higher risk of floods, and thereby spreading waterborne diseases like cholera. This is especially problematic for the world's poorest regions, which are unable to invest as heavily in climate mitigation infrastructure. And lastly, by 2030, two thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas, uh, with an increasing proportion in highly urban areas with more than 10 million population. These megacities of the future will be very densely populated and there'll be hubs for transportation and commerce and be hyper-connected, all of which amplify pandemic risk. Antibiotic resistance is another growing problem caused by the misuse and overuse of antibiotics in humans and animals that is now producing superbugs that cannot be treated with many traditional forms of antibiotics. So, all of these factors, in large animal interfaces, global warming, population growth, globalization, urbanization, they're all contributing to an acceleration of disease outbreaks. Now, in any given month, the World Health Organization traces roughly 7,000 signals of potential outbreaks, uh, which is further investigate. The WHO also has a tool that identifies which diseases that currently pose the greatest threat to public health. Among the current priority diseases are Ebola, MERS, SARS, Zika, and of course, of course COVID-19. At the bottom of the list figures disease X. Disease X represents the knowledge that a serious pandemic could be caused by a pathogen currently unknown to us. Which brings us to biotech and the empowered individual. All right. So besides accelerating risk from natural pandemics, what else could trigger the next pandemic? Well, we are also seeing increased risk from emerging biotechnology. In the past two centuries, we went from discovering the world of microbes to growing them in petri, dish in petri dishes to sequencing their genomes and now ultimately altering their DNA. Just in the last 10 years, we have seen amazing progress in this sector. Among them, cheaper genetic sequencing and the world's first genetically altered CRISPR babies. Gene drives additionally give us the power to eradicate entire species like mosquitoes if we choose to. What's more, these powerful tools are pretty broadly available from the undergraduate biologists to the do-it-yourself biohacking community. For example, recently there was a guy who made his uh, dog uh, glow in the dark, but on the other hand, there was a postdoc who was able to recreate horsepox from scratch. This democratization of biotechnology is of course not all doom and gloom. It promises great opportunity for entrepreneurship and innovation and biotech probably also holds many of the answers to the risks we are going to face in this arena. In the grand scheme of things, this technological democratization builds onto a larger trend of the individual gaining accelerating destructive capabilities through the tools and weapons enabled by technology. For this section, we've had the honor to interview the absolute badass Lord Martin Rees, Astronomer Royale and founder of the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. We have an extensive interview with him in the report, and here we've plucked out some of uh, his best quotes. So as he said, uh, the global village will have its village idiots, and they'll have global range. And it's going to change the balance between three things that we like to maintain, privacy, liberty, and security. He further said, there's not enough study of the newly emergent risk, which are of low probability, but of extreme consequence. We need to explore scenarios of what might happen in the near future and think of what uh, the world might look like in the second half of this century. He finished saying, we ought not to discriminate on grounds of date of birth. We should care about the life chances of a baby born today, which might still be alive at the beginning of the 22nd century. So what can we do about existential risk? Nick, maybe you can help tie the knot on that. Thank you. Um, concluding remarks here from, uh, from us. I think we are slightly over time here. Sorry for, for that. I, we are happy to see that most of you are still with us. Um, the report is called, and this webinar is called as well, Pandemics, Existential Risks and Enablers of Change. So to sum it up, we uh, look through the existential risk perspective, um, where we simply can conclude that we do not pay enough attention to extreme scenarios, low probability or high impact events. 
um, these risks does not uh, respect our academic boundaries, which demands interdisciplinary engagement uh, across a global scientific community. Essentially, we need to um, combine our linear thinking with exponential thinking uh, going forward. In terms of global collaboration, uh, we should strive to build uh, global resilience and move from reactive measures to proactivity, not only on the national level, but at a global level, as these risks and by definition uh, are transnational. And then we suggest uh, re to, to revitalize institutions to build global resiliency in times like these where we are not experiencing global leadership. Finally, uh, what are pandemics uh, or what this kind of current pandemic enabling? We will see the next era of global health. We stand before a digital revolution in global healthcare with new forms of data, widespread use of technology, telehealth, enabling remote care and product, uh, predictive public health care as well, um, all focusing more on prevention. As citizens and human beings, we're also now being more aware of our global community and our connections. And we will experience, as we have all experienced, this same trauma that gives us the same trigger points and similar behaviors going forward. And finally, enabling new, uh, sorry, enabling new policies, uh, we will see that uh, the pandemic will develop or either accelerate new policies and regulation as we try to adapt to our uh, to our new world. And this includes rethinking economic models, safety nets, service delivery, how we use tech, as well as the rise of mission-driven approaches to innovation. And on a final, final note, we have chosen a quote from a brilliant article from the Financial Times called Pandemics as Portals, or the pandemic is a portal. Historically, pandemic have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging our carcasses, our prejudice, our hatred, our greed, our data banks, and our dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And with that, we say thank you all for tuning in. We really hope that you found this talk inspiring and useful. Um, we have already had a bunch of really good questions asked in the Q&A uh, to round off. If you still have any questions, we will do a short live Q&A uh, now in the Q&A section of Zoom.